welcome to Kimball Christian Church Online. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Man, I am so excited about where we're headed over the next several weeks here at the church. Uh, we're starting a new series today called The Old Testament in Eight Sentences. Today, we start out talking about the Creator, God Himself, who is no doubt real and deserves our worship. Psalm 19.1 says that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim His handiwork. Our Creator is real, and we have the opportunity to come and to worship Him together. I, I hope that you take the time now to put aside the distractions that are around you and to focus on who God is and what He's done for you in your life. Let's join together in prayer as we begin our worship service this morning. Now, Heavenly Father, we come before you, God as creator and as the one that we can put our, our rest and our trust in. You give us a peace when we realize that everything is in your hands. God, I thank you for knitting us together. I thank you for knowing each one of us by name. You know the, you know the, the hairs on our heads. You know what our thoughts are. You know what's happening in our life and you know what we need. And God, you have promised that you would take care of all of that. So let us put our worries aside right now and come to you with worship and give you the glory that you deserve.
to our communion time, I just want you to reflect on 2020 as a year. Uh, so far, I think the only thing that we can actually talk about, is the one word that comes to mind in my sense is inconsistent. Everything has been inconsistent. We've got political candidates that are saying one thing, then the next day they're saying something different. We've got scientists that are saying something about COVID, and then they're saying something different. We've got all kinds of things. And isn't it nice to know as we focus on communion, that there is just one constant. There is one thing that remains consistent. Something as simple as John 3.16 simply says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Take comfort in that, knowing that as we partake of this communion and this cup today, that we have the hope, the consistency of Jesus death, burial, and resurrection. And it is that hope that we need to place our life with. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your Son who has died for us so that we can spend eternity with him. It's in your name I pray. Amen.
Hey, good morning, KCC Church family. I'm so excited to greet you this morning inside our building as we gather together indoors for a time of praise and fellowship and worship together. Let us rejoice and be glad as we worship our sovereign Lord God Almighty. My prayer is the Holy Spirit will fill this place, that he will move mightily among us today. And I pray that the Spirit of God will fill our hearts with joy and with peace as we gather together to praise his holy name. This morning we're going to begin a new series of messages from the Old Testament that will remind us that the Bible is fundamentally telling us a story. The Old Testament tells that essential first part of the story and it becomes the focus of the entire Bible. We must not miss or overlook or gloss over, rush past the importance of the first few words of Scripture, of God's revelation of himself to mankind. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I think it's important for us to understand that the Bible is not just another story. More like this great drama, this epic drama, with the world as the stage. It's an enormous play with a huge cast of characters, all of us playing our own parts in the narrative. And of course, God himself is the author, and he is the one who directs this great story. It's his story. It's history. The clincher is we're not just mere spectators. We're not just some audience watching the story unfold in the Bible. No, we are actually a part of his story. We become actors on the stage of the world. In fact, we are called and we are commissioned to join in with God's cast of his drama and play our role in our own generation. Now, like most dramas, the Bible is is divided into several different acts. We know, for example, the the Bible is divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the Bible is one fluid story of God dealing with the rebellion and sin of mankind on the one hand, and on the other hand, we see our salvation history unfold before our very eyes. That salvation history is divided into the Old Covenant and the New Covenant of grace through God's Son, Jesus Christ. So we can picture the whole Bible as a drama with several acts. I think a modern-day parallel might be what we see in the, the movies, the series of Star Wars movies, nine episodes that were produced over several years Each individual episode stands on its own, but it continues the same classic storyline of good versus evil. Individual movies were tied together with the one overarching story. And that's what the Bible is. It's one overarching story tied together through several acts. The Bible has this one overarching story of God's interaction with mankind, the creator with the created, his desire to be in fellowship and to be in unity with his creation. Now, in the coming weeks, we're going to review some of the high points of of this unfolding drama of God's story. And our goal is to see how each one of us, individually and collectively, fit into God's story, as well as the importance of us playing our parts in God's story. So in the Bible, act one is creation. That's where we will begin today. And the whole drama of human history begins when the one living eternal God chooses to create what we now call the universe, heaven and earth. God creates it good. He creates human beings in God's own likeness, his own image, in order to rule and to serve in his good creation. Act two, 
rebellion. Humans choose to distrust God's goodness. They disbelieve God's word. They disobey God's instructions. And as a result, sin and evil enter into every dimension of our human life, affecting personal and social relationships that corrupt all of us, corrupt all cultures, and bring damage and frustration to the creation. Act three, promise. The story of the rest of the Old Testament begins to unfold with God's promise to Abraham there in Genesis chapter 12. Not only will his descendants become this great nation of Israel, but they will also bring blessing to all the nations of the earth. That promise, that hope is what drives the story forward through the history of Israel. And we'll be examining that in the coming weeks. In fact, next week, one of our elders, Ed Goff, will be bringing us a message about God's promise to Abraham there in Genesis chapter 12. Act 4 is the gospel. The promise of the Old Testament comes to its fulfillment when Jesus of Nazareth is born in Bethlehem, something we'll be celebrating in a couple of months at Christmas. The central act of the biblical drama includes all that we read in the Gospels about the birth, the life, the teaching, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ, our Messiah King. Act 5 mission. The promise of Abraham is going to be fulfilled. The good news of what God has accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ, must now go to all the nations. He is the fulfillment of the promise God made to Abraham. And so the great commission is launched at the end of the gospels, the beginning of the church there in the book of Acts. And then Acts 6, the biblical drama heads to the final judgment. There is a goal to history. The good news is that evil will not have the last word. God will ultimately put all things right, dealing with and destroying all that is sinful and evil and wrong once and for all on the day of judgment. And then in Acts 7, we see the new creation. The Bible ends its drama with a dramatic new beginning. After putting all things right and restoring all things to the right way, God makes all things new. And he will come and he will dwell with his redeemed humanity that he has restored his creation forever. It's a great story. It's God's plan as he interacts with his people. The good news is that you and I have been invited by God to be a part of his great story. So today we begin the first act of the biblical drama. Act one again is creation. And again in Genesis 1-1 we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's important for us to note here that the Bible begins with creation, the creation accounts there in Genesis 1 and 2, and it ends or begins again with the new creation that we read about in Revelation 21 and 22. And in between Genesis and Revelation is the history of how God has been working to reconcile all things in heaven and earth to himself, to our Lord Jesus Christ, his one and only Son. Everything in the Old Testament points forward to Jesus. Everything in the New Testament points back to Jesus. The coming of God's Son, Jesus, into our world is indeed the hinge of all human history. So let us quickly review the message in this book of beginnings that we know as Genesis. The first 11 chapters of Genesis tell us the beginning of the world, the beginning of the nations of humanity. We learn about the beginning of sin and evil within our human experience and the effects of sin on all of us and on the earth itself. In Genesis 12 then through 50, we read about the beginning of hope 
the beginning of the promise, the beginning of the people of Israel through whom God has promised to bring blessing into our lives, into the nations of the world. The goal is to bring healing, restoration for broken and fractured relationships with God and with one another. The first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they all lay the foundation for the rest of the Old Testament and indeed the rest of the Bible. In historical terms, they take us from the creation of the universe here in Genesis 1 to the moment when the people of Israel reach the borders of the land that God has promised them, the promised land as, as Joshua leads the people into the promised land. Now, the Bible is our key to understanding God's story. It provides us with a firm foundation for our worldview as Christians, as followers of Christ. Now, a worldview, you may recall, is one, a way that one looks at life, the way one looks at the universe, the way that one looks at everything within it. Our Christian worldview, then, is the lens through which we interpret all that surrounds us in our daily lives, either consciously or unconsciously, within our culture in which we live. Our worldview is, is formed by the answers to certain key questions. And these questions include, but are not limited to, where did we come from? Who are we? What has gone wrong? And what's the solution? For Christians, for followers of Christ, it means that the overarching story of both the Old and the New Testament will tell us why we are here. It will tell us who we are. It will tell us what has gone wrong. And it will tell us that the solution is Jesus Christ, who points us to a future that is filled with promise and with hope. So with Genesis as our starting point, the Bible answers those fundamental worldview questions by telling us the true story of our beginnings from the very beginning. In the brief time that we have left this morning, I want to leave you with some key observations about God and his creation that will inform us in our world, Christian worldview. I hope and pray that these observations will help us to be prepared to engage our culture with the good news of Jesus Christ. So first, Genesis chapter 1. We learn all about the world in which we live. We owe our existence to the one single creator God who spoke into being the land, the sea, the sky, and then he filled all of them with his glorious creation, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom. And, of course, man is the crown of God's creation. We are distinct from all the other animals. Although we share many characteristics, we are unique to the animal kingdom. We are unique. Why? Because we are created in the image and the likeness of God. Genesis 1.1 tells us that there's a fundamental distinction between God as creator and everything else as being created by him. Heaven and earth have a beginning, but God was there before the beginning. And it's true that God and the universe are different, and this difference between the creator and the created is essential to all of our biblical thought, and it helps to shape our Christian worldview. The point of all this is that creation is distinct from God, and yet, it is dependent upon God. God has built into the earth this incredible capacity for renewal, recovery, balance, adaptation. But the way in which all these systems are working together, interrelated, is by itself sustained by God Almighty, the sovereign Lord of the universe. So what makes us as humans so special? What makes us unique? At first glance, the, the Bible stresses all that we have in common with the animal kingdom, with the rest of the animals. We are blessed, we're told to multiply, but then so are the animals. 
were created on the sixth day, but only after the other wild animals and domestic animals have already been created. We are created from the ground, just as they were, which hardly makes us superior to them when you think about it, when you consider that we were made from the dust of the earth uh, just like they were, and to the dust we shall return. We are given the breath of life, but so were all other living creatures that breathe. We are provided by a loving and caring God, but then so is the animal kingdom. In fact, it's a matter of wonder and awe that we share so much in common with the other animals in the love and the care and the protection of our creator God. What then makes us as humans different? What is it that makes us unique? Three things are affirmed to us in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and again in Genesis 2, 18 through 25. We are created in the image of God. In order to be equipped to exercise dominion within the created order. We were placed on this earth, initially in the Garden of Eden, in order to serve and to care for God's creation. We are created male and female in order to help one another carry out these huge responsibilities that God has entrusted to us. So it's important to note that we have a responsibility to be good stewards of God's creation. God created man in his image. He places Adam and Eve in the garden to work it and to take care of it, it says. Human rule within the creation is to be exercised by human servanthood for the creation. The pattern of servant leadership is very clear and it is modeled perfectly by Jesus himself when he deliberately in the upper room demonstrates his status as Lord and Master by stooping and serving and washing his disciples' feet. See, leadership is exercised in servanthood. It is the way of Jesus. It is the example of Jesus. We are called to follow after him in servant leadership. God has given us this immense task for mankind. We are the crown of his creation. In addition to being placed in the garden to work it and to take care of it, the text says in Genesis 1:28 that man is also to fill the earth and to subdue it, to rule over the rest of creation. A man cannot possibly tackle such an important challenge alone by himself. That is not good, the text says, that man is alone. He needs a helper, someone to help. And so God sets out not just to find a companion for Adam because he's lonely, but to find him a helper, to stand alongside him, one who is equal to him in this huge task that God has given to mankind. Adam does not just need company. He needs help. Male and female are necessary. Not only for mutual companionship and relationship in which they reflect God, but also to mutually help one another in carrying out the creation mandate that God has entrusted to humanity. In other words, we are created in relationship for relationship. We are created for our God-given task that requires relational cooperation with one another. Not only as a, a basic biological level that only a man and a woman can produce children together in order to fill the earth, but also in a wider societal level that both men and women have distinct roles, important roles of mutual edification in the great task of ruling the creation on God's behalf. So that leads us to our question, what's gone wrong? Things have simply not continued the way that God intended when he created. 
Why? Because sin enters into the human experience. It enters through rebellion and disobedience. The profound simplicity of Genesis 3 through 11 shows us at least three things about sin that the rest of the Bible then builds upon, presupposes, and demonstrates in so many different ways. For one thing, sin infects every part of our human experience. As humans, we are much more complex than the animals around us. Humans are physical, spiritual, rational, and social. The account of the temptation of Eve there in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam's collusion, I mean, he's standing right there, according to verse 6. The temptation involves all four of these dimensions of our human life and experience. It shows us how sin enters into all four of them. I won't take time this morning to read from Genesis 3, 1 through 6, but please take a look at it. We see that spiritually, sin enters when Eve begins to doubt the truth of God's goodness. It undermines her trust and her obedience. Mentally, she contemplates the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Her thinking is rational at this point. Well, it's good for food, pleasing to the eyes, Desirable for gaining wisdom. All of these capacities of the human mind are good in and of themselves. Nothing wrong with Eve using her mind or with us using our mind. The problem is that now she's using her thoughts in a direction that is forbidden by God. The problem is not the rational use of her mind. The problem is disobedience to God. Now, have you ever been there? I know I have. You know something is wrong, but you try to rationalize it in your mind. That's where Eve's at. That's where Eve went wrong. Physically, she took and she ate. This describes her physical action. She uses her hands and her mouth to commit this act of disobedience to God. And then socially, she shares the fruit with her husband, Adam, who was there with her. Adam goes along with it. He hears the conversation going on between Satan and his wife, Eve, but he just stands there like a bump on a log. He does nothing to challenge it. So the sin that is already spiritual and mental and physical now also becomes shared. And it enters into the core human relationship between husband and wife, producing shame and fear. The rest of the Bible goes on to show how sin continues to corrupt these same four dimensions in our human lives and experience. There's no part of the human person that is unaffected by sin. Sin is kind of a power and a control that exercises dominion over us until it is ultimately defeated by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And that leads us to our next question. So what is the solution? The answers to the first three questions have produced a vast problem on a cosmic level. We live in God's creation But we have spoiled that creation with our sin and our rebellion and our disobedience of God. And yes, we are made in the image of God, but we we fail to reflect the character of God. We live as a multitude of nations and cultures, but we have used this ethnic diversity as a cause for hatred and violence and injustice among the nations as well as within our own nation. We are individually sinful and disobedient to the God who created us, the one who provides for us, the one who loves us unconditionally. And as Paul reminds us, we are slaves to the dominion of sin. In all these dimensions, the whole earth stands 
under the judgment of God. Now, obviously, if there's to be any solution to our desperate situation and predicament, being separated by our sin from our loving Heavenly Father, that solution, that answer cannot come from us. We cannot save ourselves. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves because we're too radically flawed by sin to provide the answers to the mess that we have made, to our own mess. Notice that the solution that is offered to us through the scriptures does not answer the question, how do I get to heaven when I die? It's the wrong question. God wants a restored relationship with us now, right now, here and now. Not just when we die and go to heaven by and by. No, he isn't just concerned about when we leave this world. He wants to restore the relationship with him now. And so the question, the more accurate question becomes, how can the holy God who created, the loving creator God, how can he once again dwell in harmony with the humans that he created in his image in the midst of the earth in which we live on that is subject to God's curse because of sin. That is the problem that the whole scripture addresses and that ultimately God solves. God's ultimate vision of his story recorded for us in the Bible is not about us going somewhere else up to heaven in order to be with God, but rather God coming to dwell with us. I mean, that's what John 1.14 tells us. The word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. And history marches forward to God's ultimate victory with all who are redeemed by the blood of Christ, the atoning blood of the atoning work of Christ on the cross where every tongue and tribe and nation will be unified in a new creation, purged of all sin and evil that is described for us in Revelation 21 and 21, a new heaven and a new earth. This is the solution that God alone provides for us. We can't save ourselves, so God intervened in order to save us. It is by his grace that we can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness for our sins is available through Jesus Christ that will restore us to a right relationship vertically with God and horizontally with our fellow man. And that forgiveness is centered in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He paid the penalty for our sin. He, through his atoning death, the wages of sin have been paid. And his gift to us is the free gift of God, which is eternal life. It is the good news of the gospel message. It is God's solution to the sinfulness of each and every individual. It's the solution to the brokenness that we find in our societies and in our nations. It is the solution to the curse and the frustration that we experience here on earth. So in the coming weeks, we will see this unfolding story of our salvation history as we, as we review these different acts in the drama that are recorded for us in God's word. It's going to be an epic journey, I believe. And it's my prayer that you will learn more about God's great love for you, more about yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior, more about how God has provided the way for us to be restored to him into a right relationship with God and a right relationship with one another. But you know what? The good news is you don't have to wait. Today just could be your day of salvation. You can trust in Jesus today and you can say yes to him. I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. 
Will you come and be my Lord and Savior? If you have questions about how to do that, love to have you talk with me or one of the staff, one of the elders. We'd love to sit down to you and talk more about what it means to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today and being able to come back indoors and worship you. Lord, we pray that all that we say and do is pleasing to you. And Lord, if there is someone who is searching for answers to, to life's questions, Father, that you would open the door, that your spirit would move mightily, and that you, you would use us for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.